The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the hosts and creators of this program. This is the Pet Buzz. This is the Pet Buzz. Freshly collected with news, celebrity pet gossip, and the latest pet trends. The Pet Buzz gives you the latest 411 on everything pet related. Everything pet related. Hosted by pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. And here's the Dynamic, Dynamic pet, pet Duo. Duo. Hello, hello, hello. You're listening to the Pet Buzz, the ultimate in pet talk radio. Let's start the show with a big announcement. Right, Dr. Fleck? Yeah, absolutely. We want to welcome Florida's WENG at 1530 AM and 107.5 FM, as well as WFLN 1480 AM to the Pet Buzz family. Yay. We love to hear from our new listeners. We encourage you to contact us on our social media channels or email us at team at the pet buzz.com. Please send us your questions, comments, and of course, pictures of your pooches. And I also want to remind you that as you listen to the show, check out our social media feeds. We post relevant content as to what is airing at the moment. Now, let's get on with the show. Let the countdown begin. Four. It's hard enough to lose weight, let alone keep it off our pets. Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine's Dr. Megan Shepard is here to offer up some advice about dealing with feline weight problems. She's promoting slimming down fat cats and keeping off their pounds. Don't miss this, but you'll have to stick around for segment four. Three, another Halloween is upon us. And in segment three, Halloween and Costume Association Administrator Michelle Buggy is joining us to talk about the 2019 Halloween trends and safety concerns. And two, we love it. And we know you do, too. We are talking about celebrity gossip and flex facts. And one, now we're bringing on our first guest who is talking about the dangers of vaping to pets. Joining us today is Dr. Tristan Darty, leader and emergency veterinarian at VCA Veterinary Emergency Services and Veterinary Specialty Center in Middleton, Wisconsin. Welcome to the Pet Buzz, Thank doctor. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we're glad that you're here. So you recently treated a dog who ingested a marijuana vaping device. How is that dog, doctor? That dog did well. Um, took him a good 12 to 14 hours to fully recover. Uh, did not get as bad as we thought, uh, but he recovered fully and uh, went home actually same day. So I think uh, we got lucky on that one. That's great. You know, I think it was really interesting because what the articles I was reading said the owners were a little reluctant to say that it was a marijuana vaping device, although you did see the signs of marijuana ingestion. Is that correct? Yeah, it was classic. Marijuana ingestion has got a pretty classic presentation and usually hone in on that pretty quickly. Although there's not a lot of research, what's the biggest problem in vaping when it comes to pets? I think the biggest issue is that there's very little information about how much of the drug is actually in the liquid. And then, of course, there's the big question of how much the pet is actually ingested, if they actually break or ingest the liquid. You just don't know what the dose is. With any toxin, you're all you're doing a lot of guesswork because many times owners don't know how much they got, but especially when it's a liquid of an unknown concentration, who knows how much they got of whatever drug is actually in them. Yeah, but I also was under the impression that you really don't even know what's in the vaping liquids. That is true. Completely, and a and lot again, of them are, are coming from China, and we don't really know, you know, they're all different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just don't know. There's just so little data out there, and there's so little, what appears to be so little regulation, you just have no idea what else could be going on along with the main drug that you suspect has been ingested. Yeah, and then people are, you know, vaping with THC, they're, you know, Mm -hmm. they're vaping with marijuana, and and they're Mm -hmm. vaping, I guess, with more added nicotine, is that correct? Yeah, so some of the vaping weapons can be fairly concentrating for nicotine, and as You'd expect it's dose dependent, so you get a tiny chihuahua that chews on a cartridge. They make it a massive dose of nicotine, um, but again, the amount, the concentration that they actually get is just simply unknown. Just no information is out there. Well, I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to ask you what side effects might you see if your dog punctures or ingests a vaping cartridge? Yeah, so I mean, most of the ones are going to be nicotine related. Nicotine in dogs generally causes vomiting, um, excitability high heart rate, cardiac arrhythmias, 
sometimes seizures, and they can be fatal if the dose is high enough. Does it happen uh, right so away, now, or does it take a period of time? Nicotine is very rapidly absorbed, which is why humans enjoy it, of course. Um, the same thing goes for dogs. If they ingest cigarette butts or the liquid, it is very rapidly absorbed, and it's, it's hard to decontaminate fully. For things like cigarette butts, luckily, it's a very strong medic in dogs, and they will often vomit pretty quickly, but again, it's pretty rapidly absorbed, so you can still see signs, even if they vomited. In terms of marijuana, marijuana ingestion in dogs, um, again, it has a pretty classic presentation in the you know, with us ER vets. They'll typically come in somewhat dizzy. Um, they will be a little bit hypersensitive to stimuli, um, kind of twitchy. And then the biggest uh, giveaway that we always look for is, are they leaking urine all over the floor? Ah, um, so I never heard about that before. Yeah. Some people come in thinking their dog is has a UTI and they're peeing all over the place, but you'll find they're a little wobbly as well. And maybe there's some teens in the house. You can put two and two together pretty fast. <laughs> I, do they have glossy eyes, like when you're classically high, that kind of look, or no? They, they look disoriented. It's not that okay. sort of glassy eye classic, but they do look disoriented, and they'll just be standing and slowly start to fall over. Um, <laughs> But again, I'm sorry I'm laughing, but I'm just imagining the dog falling over and peeing all over the place with gla- with semi-glassy yeah. eyes. Okay, so yeah. not to not take this seriously, of course, everyone. So if you think your pet is ingested e-juice or any type of marijuana compound, what should you do? Should you try to oh, wait it out? No. I mean, since you have no idea what the ingestion level is, I would get them to a, a veterinarian as soon as you can. Most run-of-the-mill marijuana intoxications are going to be fine. Um, again, with vaping liquids, the concentration, especially with some new formulations of marijuana up there, hash oil, we actually have been reported fatalities, which is rare before this. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, if you think they've ingested something, then you should just see a veterinarian so they can assess that and decide what the course of treatment is. And generally, what is the course of treatment? So for nicotine ingestion, we will typically decontaminate them They'll go on an EKG to watch their heart rate, blood pressure. We'll deal with any arrhythmia if that might occur. If they're continuing to vomit, they'll get antiemetics. If they develop any kind of neurologic seizure type episode, we'll deal with that with separate medications. So you're treating symptomatically and trying to decontaminate whatever's left. For severe marijuana ingestion, we will typically, well, not typically, we'll sometimes give intravenous lipid therapy, which is a medication uh, both human and veterinary uh, services have used for certain types of toxins, and we've seen some pretty rapid resolution with the severe marijuana dogs, but the lipids, the ones that are just flat puddles of dog, and they recover pretty quickly. Generally, it's just time, and if it is a dog that comes in that's clear, a marijuana dog, and they can walk, and uh, they're not too stumbly, sometimes I'll even send them home the same day, knowing that, you know, in 12, 24 hours, they'll be just fine. You know, one of the biggest deterrents I find for carelessness is knowing what things cost. Now, I'm not going to quote you, but I mean, if your dog does ingest, (laughs) um, you know, a vaping device and, and, you know, eat some e-juice or licks up some e-juice, what are we talking about? Are we talking about like a thousand, five thousand? Yeah, I mean, depending upon how severe it is, you know, it could be anywhere from uh, one to two thousand, depending upon the severity of science and how long it could be in a hospital. For your really fluffy marijuana dog that we're just going to do some lipids and they'll probably be fine in 24 hours. You know, you're probably under a thousand. Still not a, a small amount for no. things that are unexpected, of course. No, but, you know, depending on where you are, you know, various parts mm-hmm. of the country, if you're in L.A. or in New York, oh, yeah. uh, maybe okay. if you're in Palm Beach, that bill is going to be looking like 5000 plus. Yeah, so I was easily triple what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. And I like to talk about the price because I find that price always acts as the best deterrent, especially this time of the year with Halloween candy. You're you're a little hesitant about leaving it around so your your dogs or cats can get into it when you know Christmas is coming. So it's kind of the same yeah. thing. So, you know, not to scare anybody out there, but we just want you to really understand the side effects. And then, of course, the dog is going through trauma because he's at the vet, he's having medical treatment. Um, and then, of course, then you get the bill and then you're kind of like, you got to sit down. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. Well, that was veterinarian Dr. Tristan Darty leader talking about the dangers of vaping to our pets. Up next, we're learning what celebrity's pet loves to play with sex toys and about Wendy Williams' new companions. And of course, Flex Facts.
You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We would love to communicate with you via social media. Use the Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. I want to be a contender. I want a warm belly to sleep on. A big house. How do I look? Do, do I look good? I want to play hard. My nails done once a month. I want. I want. I want a home. I just want a home. I want someone to love. Last year, more than 30,000 companion animals came to us without homes. 20,000 of them were felines. Let's make some homes. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Hey, I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed, and research shows walking at least a half an hour every day can reduce a person's risk for heart disease and other serious illnesses. So regular walking is a great way to live a long and happy life. For most dogs, an hour of physical activity each day is necessary and will help them lead healthier lives free of disease. Walking a dog does not only have a physical benefit, there are plenty of psychological benefits for both the dog and the owner. There are so many smells, sights, and sounds in the outdoors that a dog is mentally stimulated every time he or she walks out the front door. Taking a dog on a walk will also help to solidify the strong bond between you and your animal. Give your dog some positive attention by doing what he or she loves. Take your dog out for a neighborhood walk today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Pet Buzz. This show is hosted by the dynamic pet duo. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. It's time for the celebrity pet dish. Well, I have to admit that I've never followed Kate Beckinsale up until now. It seems that her cat, Willow, is obsessed with sex toys. In one of Beckinsale's recent video posts, Willow refuses to give up her, get this, sperm toy. P.S. You can buy a feline sperm toy on Etsy. In another of Beckinsale's videos, the cat is playing with a golden penis that it's not ready to give up. Fans can't seem to get enough of these sexual-oriented clips. Of course, I post the videos on our social media channel so that you can check them out. But I'm just curious about what goes on at Beckinsale's home. Okay, so more news about talk show host Wendy Williams. You know, she's just welcomed two four-legged friends into her home. Recently, the talk show host, who's 55, revealed that she's adopted two new rescue kittens, a gray cat and a black cat both female. The kittens are sisters as well. And Wendy says that she loves them so much. They came to the house. They immediately bonded. She thinks they're just wonderful. She also said that she feels like she has such a full life with them. You know, they love each other so much. And really, they don't bother her that much. That's what she said. Well, Williams gave her new pet some perfect names, too. So newly independent, having recently split from her longtime husband and manager, William named her gray cat My Way, as in My Life, My Way. And the shady cat, meanwhile, got a name with a nod to William's illustrious career in radio and television. Its name is Chit Chat. Well, Wendy, this is from the girl who met you who had the run in the stocking. Good luck, Wendy. We love you, and we're happy that you got some two four-legged family members in your life. Okay, and now what you guys have been waiting for. Flex Facts, one of our most popular segments on the show. Welcome to Just the Facts. Just the Facts. Fact or fiction? Just the Facts, ma'am. You want answers! I want the truth! This is going to take long. You got the time. So, Dr. Fleck, what are we talking about this week on your own special segment on Flex Facts? P. This week on Flex Facts, we are talking about collecting 
a urine sample from our cats. So, Dr. Fleck, why would you need to do this, and how do we begin? Well, we want to do, if there's some irregularity in urine patterns, uh, we think possibly there's a bladder infection or kidney involvement, you need to collect urine as one of the tools for diagnosis. Okay, so how do we begin? First, you need to gather the equipment. If you need to take a urine sample from your cat, your vet may be able to provide you with a special kit filled with items you need, or if you're likely to be testing your cat's urine on an ongoing basis, you can find this equipment from online stores or some pet supply stores. You will need a special non-absorbent litter, such as special beaded balls or non-absorbent sand, a clean syringe, a clearly labeled sealable sample pot supplied by your vet or provided as part of the urine sample kit, a litter tray that has been thoroughly cleaned. Why beaded balls? They need to be impervious to liquid. Beaded balls can be a good way to give your cat the environment she needs to go in without soaking up the wee-wee itself, which will make it easier for you to collect later. Okay, and then what's next? Well, what's next? Keep calm so that your pet doesn't pick up on the stress you might be feeling. And don't expect your cat to pee while you're watching. That makes sense, doesn't it? Don't (laughs) pee while you're watching. I don't want anyone to pee while I'm watching. Cats are less likely to urinate immediately if they're closed in a room and expected to perform, just like us. In fact, it can take several hours for your cat to decide that she or he's happy with her new litter and is ready to go. Instead... Leave your cat plenty of water and let nature take its course. And you will have to keep any other pets away until the deed is done to ensure you end up with a sample from the right pet. Make sense? Yeah. So how do we store the sample? Once your cat is urinated on the non-absorbent litter, her wee-wee should gather at the bottom of the tray. Then using a clean syringe, collect a sample and place it in a clean, sealable pot supplied by your vet, or provided as part of the urine sample kit. It's important that the sample is tested as quickly as possible. The lab will tell you that. Within two to four hours is preferable, as this will provide the most accurate results. If this turnaround time is impossible, though, make sure to place the sample in the fridge and get it tested within the next 24 hours. Okay, so what if you can't collect a sample? What do you do? If you find you're struggling to get a sample, don't hesitate to ask your vet. Vets can often collect a urine sample by extracting it directly, or they can administer an injection, which causes the animal to pee into the prepared pot. Anything else? That's it. That's all the Flex Facts for the week. Great. That was great segment about collecting urine from cats. More of the pet buzz very soon, but I bet you can't wait for my I Like You of the Week. You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We love to communicate with you via social media. Use The Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and our buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. I'm petrologist Charlotte Reed with a healthy pet, healthy you tip. There are many reasons that you might have to shelter at home with your pets, such as unsafe air quality, dangerous roads, and or high winds and flying debris, but you have to be prepared. So here are some suggestions. Make sure your pet's inside. If it's unsafe for you to be outside, it's unsafe for him too. Know the location of your pet's emergency go bag. It should have already been stocked with extra food, water, first aid kit, and other essentials your pet needs. Take your pet with you to a room that's safe. The room's location is based on whether you are sheltering from a hurricane, earthquake, tornado, flood, or blizzard. If there's a wildfire, it's best to take your pet and leave the premises immediately. Bring a battery-operated radio to ensure that you can get updates from emergency officials, even if the power goes out and your phone or internet connection or down. 
if time allows, move your pet's favorite bed or blanket to your safe room so that you can make him as comfortable as possible until the threat passes. Since pets can get restless if cooped up inside in one room, bring items to keep him engaged, such as toys, games, and learning activities. Make sure your pet has a place to relieve himself. Keeping puppy pee pads on hand can be useful for this purpose, as can potty training your dog to go indoors. Have a few disposable litter boxes for cats, too. Make sure to have cleaning supplies on hand in case of an accident. Keep your pet away from the windows. Debris may be flying around during a storm due to high winds. In fact, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention says that flying debris is the most common cause of injury during a hurricane. Be ready for you and your pet to leave at a moment's notice. Keep your dog's leash, crate, or carrier, and any necessarily travel gear near the exit. For cats, have a carrier or pop-up shelter and other essentials. Once gone, you can refer to your emergency evacuation plan. You know, pets know when there's panic in the air, so try to remain as calm as possible. This is pet trendologist Charlotte Reed with a healthy pet, healthy you tip. Stay safe. When your doctor recommended omega fatty acids as a daily supplement, he told you that they promoted better heart, brain, skin, joint, and immune system health. Well, doesn't it make sense for your pet to have the same health benefits? EpiPet Whole Fish Treat, an all-natural smoked fish supplement, is 100% bioavailable, bringing your pets the nutrients they need to keep them healthy and happy. We first heard about EpiPet at our local rescue shelter where our family adopted Lucy, a 10-year-old yellow lab. She was in tough shape, but we noticed within just a few days how soft and thick her coat was getting. She has more energy now, loves to chase her favorite tennis ball, and most importantly, how happy and healthy Lucy is now. We could not be happier. Thanks, EpiPet. To order better pet health for your dog or cat, just visit epi-pet.com. That's epi-pet.com. Welcome back. You're listening to the Pet Buzz, the best in pet talk radio. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. Now for my I likey of the week. Hey, I'm excited. I'm very excited. Okay? Pretend you like it, no matter how bad it stinks. This week, I went to New York City with Ty to have some Halloween fun. The Dodo, the number one animal brand on digital and most engaged with media brand on mobile in the world, is throwing a wild experiential event for you and your pup aptly dubbed the best day ever halloween edition this halloween themed event runs thursday through saturday october 4th through october 27th in williamsburg brooklyn very hip neighborhood and features a trick-or-treat shop for pups a canine corn maze and even a pumpkin patch stuffed full of toys among other dog-centric attractions dyson has a mad scientist themed booth that help pet owners tackle dander fur and dirt in their homes and also have groomers on hand to make sure that pooches are looking extra polished for all the photo ops target provides a photo booth for dressed up dogs and humans to capture timeless memories together there will even be a booth in collaboration with project forever home so if you show up without a dog you might just be able to find your new best friend for life and take them home tickets to the best dog day ever cost 35 dollars for a pup and they're human 25 dollars just for an adult and 15 for children for two hours at the event family packs are also available for purchase all tickets can be found at Best dog day ever. The event takes place indoors at 25 Kent Avenue in Brooklyn, Williamsburg neighborhood. Check out the pictures of Ty and me on the Pet Buzz and the Charlotte Reed social media channels at their VIP day of the best dog day ever, Halloween edition. We had a blast. And now for our second guest of the day. Did you know that there's a Halloween and Costume Association, Dr. Flo? I did not. Well, the executive director is here to tell us how they help promote the spookiest time of the year. So joining us today is Halloween and Costumes Association, Michelle Buggy. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us on the Pet Buzz today. I'm happy to be here. Can you please tell us a little bit about the association, what it does, and who are members? 
we are a not-for-profit association, and our members are primarily manufacturers of Halloween um, costumes, products, decor, accessories, and novelties. And it came together in about 2004 to promote the safe celebration of Halloween and costume events in North America. Cool. Well, that we're so excited. And, you know, they, Dr. Fleck, they even have, like, a big Halloween trade meeting every year. Wow. Yeah. I mean, how spooky is that? It, ha- it actually com- it comes up in January. I'll be done. I think I'm going to have to try to go this year. I'm sure you will try. <laughs> okay. Well, Michelle, how has celebrating Halloween changed over the years, especially when, I guess, when it comes to even dogs? Absolutely. Well, that has totally, totally changed the last few years. And um, the celebration of Halloween grows every single year, and it's gone just beyond being just for kids. Adults are celebrating it more and more. It's actually increased back in 2007, about 59% of adults celebrated Halloween. And 10 years later in 2017, 72% have. So you can see that it's growing and it's largely due to it being millennials' favorite holiday. So as more of them are becoming parents, you know, they'll continue to grow that family celebration and um, involving community as well. And most importantly, when it comes to family, it's also involving pets. And uh, that has really skyrocketed in recent years as far as pets involvement. About um, 20% of pet owners actually dress up their um, pets in costumes. And um, the favorite, which I was a little surprised by, uh, is a, a pumpkin costume. So, um, And then second favorite pet costume um, nationally is um, dressing up their pet like a hot dog. A hot dog, because it's a <laughs> hot it's dog. Because everyone wants to believe. Everyone wants to believe their dog is a hot dog. I have to tell you the truth. I do have a hot dog and a hamburger costume <laughs> for my dog. You had a question, Dr. Fleck. Yeah, we know that safety is a major concern of the Halloween Costume Association. So what should consumers be concerned about when selecting costumes? Well, the first priority typically for for most people is is children, right? So the children's costumes are heavily regulated by the federal government. So you can know that they've been tested if they're sold here in the U.S. Um, And the most important thing is to look at the label to make sure that it's flame retardant and flame resistant. Um, That's probably the, the biggest key And then pets, uh, you know, have a lot of things, too, for pet costumes, making sure they're comfortable, that that's the biggest thing is, right, even though they might look adorable in it, you shouldn't force your pet into a costume if it's not happy to be in it. But typically they can even, and if they don't want to be in the entire costume, what works well a lot of times is a partial costume, right? Like they might love the bow tie or that, or the hat, or they don't want the hat. So usually you can make it work with at least part of the pet costume. You know, it's really interesting. And one of the things that I found on the Halloween and Costume Association website, and this is really about costume flammability, is that if your pet costume is not um, fire retardant, they have a recipe on the website so that you could possibly make your pet's costume flame retardant. How about that? Well, if you've just joined us, we're talking with the Halloween and Costume Association's Michelle Buggy about ways to get your pet involved in the spookiest time of the year. Your website's a great resource for Halloween revelers. It's full of crafts and other ideas about how to enjoy the holiday in your community. Any ideas or thoughts that can be tweaked to make them pet friendly? Well, I think the biggest one is to actually bring your dog trick or treating, right? It's great to get them out there and get them some exercise, and um, that's something that we're seeing more and more of. So, and it, but sometimes it just doesn't come to mind, right? You're so focused on the kids, but you know, pets can have a great time too. They love the attention, being around the kids. And if you're on the other side of it, if you're not the one trick or treating and you're the one giving out the treats, um, you can also um, have some pet friendly treats available, which is a lot of fun too for not only the ones for the people that are trick or treating with their pets, but even just to take it home for their pets. They can bring them a little home, a little surprise after a night out of trick-or-treating. And the other kind of big trend we're seeing, too, is that ways to get pets more involved is parades. More and more communities are doing parades. And, um, you know, it's fun to, to, you know, come together as a family. A lot of times people are incorporating their pet into their family theme for costumes, whether it be superheroes or a favorite movie like, you know, Star Wars and Harry Potter or sort of characters or what have you. It's, it's really becoming more of a whole family uh, event, including the pets. You know, I also liked your idea for uh, having a home movie in your backyard. You can invite your pets. They can dress up in costume. How about that, Dr. Yeah. Fleck? That's the way we used to do it all the time. I know, and we have that. We have a huge piece of property. We live in a commercial street, so we have a huge 
white wall, so we should show a pet movie. That's a good idea. To everyone can bring their own chairs. Our <laughs> video mural. That was a great idea. Hey, tell us about um, maybe a little bit about this uh, National Trick or Treat Day as your association's national initiative to promote the holiday, and how can it help our pet owning listeners too? Absolutely. So last Halloween, we had the initiative where we wanted to actually change the date of Halloween from the 31st to the last Saturday. And America was split on it. Um, it kind of resurfaced a few months ago, and again, America was split. So we went back to the drawing board and said, what can we come up with that would be um, embraced by the whole country? And what we found out is that people love the idea of celebrating Halloween on the last Saturday. They just didn't actually want to necessarily move it. So that's where we um, have shifted gears just a little bit, and now we're launching um, National Trick or Treat Day, which is to take place on the last Saturday of October. And the purpose of that day is for trick or treating, community events like block parties and parades, and it just is um, a safer opportunity to celebrate the holiday. And also, it helps with truancy. There's a lot of um, school that gets mixed and missed the day after Halloween when it's on a school day, so it just makes it a morally fun, you know, long celebration that everyone can enjoy. You know, you can get your pet involved. You're not rushing around the house trying to get your kids out the door you know what i mean so it just makes it a lot better celebration and we can all enjoy halloween a lot more i think it's a great initiative i'd rather it be on a saturday than on random days of the week it's just safer the community is more involved people are more more relaxed and you're not like missing work or having to come home early if you have a presentation or anything Okay, that was Michelle Buggy, Executive Director of the Halloween and Costume Association. For more information, visit the Halloween and Costume Association.org. Up next, you want to love it. You want it. You definitely want to love it. Stay tuned. More of the pet buzz very soon. So I'm Rex, and normally I'm pretty nervous about having to go see the vet, but this Dr. Fleck, he seems like he'd be okay. Like, he might even give me an extra treat if I let him rub my belly. Hey, my name is Rory Diamond. I am the CEO of Canines for Warriors. We are the nation's largest provider of service dogs for disabled American veterans. And we are asking everyone to support Puppies Assisting Wounded Service Persons Act, House Bill 3130. Absolutely critical to do this. It will require the VA to help organizations like Canines for Warriors serve our disabled veterans with incredible life-saving service dogs and to recover from post-traumatic stress. Please contact the member of Congress to support Puppies Assisting Wounded Service Persons Act, House Bill 3130. Hi, I'm Brad Garrett. In 2007, the investigation of the Humane Society of the United States exposed the link between pet stores and puppy mills. Large puppy mill operations were busted in Maine, Oklahoma, Texas, and Virginia. Bottom line, puppy mills are cruel and their puppies are often sick. So do yourself a favor and go to your local shelter for your next dog. You'll get an inoculated, already fixed dog for almost nothing. So you'll not only save some money, but you'll also save a life. I'm petrondologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We're urban, suburban, and country. country. Okay. We're going to kick off the segment with some global pet news. And now, pet buzz news from around the globe. Let's start with a recollection of a past segment. I don't know if you remember our talking about Greg Manifuel on the show. Manifuel 49 nearly died. He lost parts of his arms and legs as well as the skin on his nose and part of his upper lip. The cause was capnocyphagia, a germ from his dog, Ellie's mouth, or from a dog he encountered. Capnocyphagia is commonly found in saliva of dogs and cats. It almost never leads to people getting sick unless the person has a compromised immune system. But Manifuel was perfectly healthy. In fact, he doesn't even think he ever used his health insurance before he fell ill. Through more than 20 surgeries, Greg still has his dog, Ellie, who sits beside him when he's frustrated or feeling down. At night, she sleeps under the covers. And at dinner, she's there next to him, knowing that he'll throw something her way. She is not the stereotypical of a vicious pit bull. Moreover, she's his pet. And he never wanted to get rid of her based on what happened to him. But here's the news, the current news and the current research 
from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, connected to Harvard Medical School, as well as the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Beth Israel's Deaconess Medical Center, that has been investigating cases like his. The team has done genetic testing on five otherwise healthy people who suffered from capnocyphagia infections to see if they could find anything in common. Believe it or not, they discovered all of these people had a gene connected to the immune system that was working differently a genetic variant. They believe it makes those people more susceptible to developing severe medical problems from capnocyphagia, but they're also trying to determine if there are any other risk factors. Of the five in the study, three survived with amputations and two did not. The team hopes that if their theory is confirmed, it will help diagnose cases faster. Researchers need to gather more evidence, but hope to publish their study in the next 16 months. So, I understand that our next guest is on the phone, Megan Shepard, a clinical nutrition professor at Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech, is talking with us about slimming down cats and keeping off the pounds. Dr. Shepard, thank you for joining the Pet Buzz today. Thank you for having me today. So according to the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, an estimated 60% of cats in the U.S. were overweight or obese. So, Dr. Shepard, why are our cats so fat? I'm, I'm going to break it down to two general reasons. I think awareness is one reason. Not everyone that has an overweight pet is aware that their pet's overweight. And I think also because we have a lot of pets that are overweight, it has skewed our perception of ideal in general. The other reason I would say is it's easy to feed pets, especially indoor pets, particularly the sedentary ones that don't have jobs or aren't, you know, aren't really active. So I think awareness and is one piece, but it, it is easy uh, to overfeed and we need to ensure that we're tailoring each pet's diet to their individual needs. Well, you know, it's interesting because I read somewhere and I thought this was really mildly amusing, but true. You've been quoting a saying, food is love. So tell our audience what you mean by that. Food is love. Yeah. Pets are often rewarded with food and these things can add up just a little bit here, a little bit there, a lick of ice cream here, a little treat there. All these things can really add up. And so we have alternatives that are calorie free, such as playtime, belly rubs, you know, other forms of petting, brushing, are some other ways we could provide love, snuggling as an alternative to food. And I think it's also easy to overfeed when we have these really cute eyes locked on us, particularly when we perceive that this behavior is due to hunger. I think pets train us as humans very well. But I also think it's transference. I mean, you know, like if I had a great day, I want to come home and have some haagen <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's food for love. <laughs> it's food for love. Or, for example, like I was baking pumpkin pies this weekend. Mm-hmm. Dr. Flex, like, why are you baking pies? I like to bake when I'm stressed. But, you know, I like to, like, make special things. Because food is love, Dr. Fleck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this year, (laughs) you conducted a weight loss study with Purina. Tell us about your research and your protocols, and what did your research reveal? So we enrolled 44 overweight cats without um, obvious problems. And when they came in for their first check-in, we, for the cat, we did body weight and body condition scoring, and then talked to the cat owners about what to feed, how much to feed, went over the weight loss plan. We sent the cats home with a weight loss food measuring cup and instructions. So then cats and their owners came back monthly for rechecks where we did rechecks on body weight, looked at uh, the rate of weight loss, and just generally check in and see how things are going. Our goal weight loss rate was 0.5 to 2% of body weight per week. Um, So for a 20-pound cat, that would be 0.1 to 0.4 pounds per week. Wow. Yeah. So if a cat wasn't losing at that rate, we would make adjustments to their diet. So we had cats lost weight to different, to varying degrees. Some cats lost at 0.5% of body weight. Some others lost at 1% of body weight per week. All fine and well with all the great statistics and information, but... I'm a pet owner, I'm a cat owner, a fat cat. How do I 
get on this plan? How do I start it? Do you have some special food? Mm -hmm. So we, I generally prefer to use a veterinary weight loss diet. These diets are, they're, they're quote unquote prescription because they are available through veterinarians only for the most part. And then the other part is snacks are okay as long as they're under control. And in this study, we found that actually cats will eat vegetables, mostly if we add something to enhance the flavor, but vegetables can help that time between meals. Something else is feeding using a food toy or a puzzle to slow consumption. Okay. Is it kind of like a high-fiber diet? I mean, do cats need to exercise like dogs and humans? Yeah, it's similar. So exercise is great. Um, it is hard. It's not easy to uh, to convince cats, particularly sedentary cats, to exercise. So that's a matter of kind of trial and error and figuring out what works. We found that many cats, as they lost weight, became more active. But yeah, exercise is, is great when it can be implemented along with diet. But the weight loss diets, as I mentioned, you know, they're higher in in nutrients so that we can lower calories, they're generally higher in fiber to help with that feeling of fullness. Well, Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for joining us today on the Pet Buzz. I'm sure that some of our obese cat owners will be a little bit thinking about, they'll be stimulated to maybe try to consider the health of that pet and consider your diets. Exactly. That would be great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Well, everyone, that was veterinarian Dr. Megan Shepard talking about the feline struggle to lose weight. Learn more about Dr. Shepard's study at vetmed.vt.edu. You know, Dr. Fleck, it's really interesting. We both worry about our weight. Yep. We go to the gym, we work out, we yep. try to eat the best we possibly can. And then, of course, we worry about our dog's weight. Yep. But what I find most interesting is the only member of our house that we never, ever have to worry about his weight is our cat, Hayden. Yep. Which is so funny. I mean, a show cat, tons of hair. Yeah, but many, many people have fat cats. Our I cat know is we do. Thin. But I think the one thing that Dr. Megan said that I thought was really the most interesting was that most people have kind of, kind of convince themselves that it's the standard for being a certain more blob shaped area. So I think that's why that chart that, you know, they have for dogs and cats, when people come into the office, they should see it front and center and be able to look up and say, gee, my pet's fat. And you know, I've seen that pendulous movement of that fat right. in the abdomen. They don't have that, so many cats. They don't have that sleek, you know, <laughs> streamline, get thinner at the waist. <laughs> Well, you know what that means. It's time to go. But first, we want to give you a preview for next week's show. Next week is our Halloween edition. We're talking Halloween costumes, black hats, and reducing disease at holiday events. You don't want to miss this because, you know, I love Halloween. And Dr. Fleck, will you do me the honor of thanking our guests? Special thanks to our guests, Dr. Tristan Doherty Leiter, Michelle Buggy, and Dr. Megan Shepard. And we always want to thank our sponsors, the Animal Medical Center of Bradenton and EpiPet, making better skin, coat, and ear care products for healthier pets everywhere. If you have a question, write us at team at thepetbuzz.com. We'll cover it on our next week's show. And if you've missed any portion of the show, visit our social media channels as well as your favorite streaming channels and listen to the linked podcast on Monday morning. Most importantly, remember we're here each week to help you take better care of your pets. Peace out and pet love. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pet Buzz. The Pet Buzz is hosted by the dynamic pet duo, pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. Tune in each week for the latest 411 on everything pet related. Visit our website at www.thepetbuzz.com. Learn more about us, the show, and our guests. My name is Michelle Schaefer. I'm the mom of three boys, and I'm from Haddonfield and North Wildwood, New Jersey. I met Aladdin through my work with Lilo's Promise Animal Rescue, and I foster the emaciated dogs that come into our program. Aladdin came to us. He had been dumped at the side of the road. 
He weighed about 18 pounds. He had broken bones, other wounds, and he was missing 12 teeth. He was the worst abuse case I had ever seen. The most moving experience that I've had while working with Aladdin were when we were first responders at the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida. And Aladdin usually works off leash. He was on leash that night and he led me over to a very specific person. And here that man had been in the nightclub the night of the shootings. He and Aladdin shared a very special moment that really made me cry. Aladdin has changed the way I see the world in a million different ways. The main thing is to treat people with kindness and compassion. My name is Michelle Schaefer and Aladdin and I are individuals.